what was it like growing up for you as a child? What do you What do you remember like? Uh, um, yeah, what'd you like to do? Well, I had like I like to dance. Really? Yeah. I came from a family of musicians and dan- and, and models, actually. No kidding. And my mother, um, she modeled and mm-hmm. was on the on front cover of um, Vogue magazine. Awesome. Yeah, and then my father. And he did music, and so did my um, rest of my family, the five stair steps. Those are my cousins. Yeah. Shut the front <laughs> door, Lionel. Yes. The five stair steps are your cousins. Yep. That's my grand. You've been, you've been holding this back all these years, all this stuff. See, in here, I, I was totally stuck on the fact that you guys are supposed to be connected. <laughs> he can dance. Uh, oh, well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yes, but the, I mean, so there's the five stair steps. Yeah. R and B. R and B. Oh, there. It is. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So then you got the he George Bench just like he's not my blood uncle, but he's like my uncle. Um, I used to, yeah. <laughs> he's looking at me. What? I know George. <laughs> uh, yeah. So very close with him and his son. Um, I used to break dance and pop. Yeah, and I love doing it. I had a break dance crew, um, but I was, what, what? Yes, back up. You said you had a break dance school crew. Oh, I thought you said school. No, no, no. You, you had a crew. You got to spend more time watching so that you think you can dance with me. Well, I don't watch that, but I did watch all those cruise movies when okay. the kids were watching them all. So you had New York City Breakers, Rocksteady, Bugle Boys. Um, USA, it was a, a few of them. What was Bugle, yours? Bugle Boys was on. Bugle Boys. We're out of Patterson, New Jersey. You yeah. know I'm going to be Googling. <laughs> that was Find a, some YouTube videos. Yeah. Are you Actually, on there? There's a video. I didn't go to do the video, but yeah. like the, they're in it. Yeah. Uh, we're Roxanne. They danced with her. Mm-hmm. Um, we were basically one out of New York and New York. Um, few different other places we went to do bat- what you call battles and stuff yeah. like that. And um, that's how I met my son. I remember I met my um, daughter's mother mm-hmm. at a club called Buttersfield in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And we were battling New York City Breakers and we won. And wow. So, and that's how I met her. So How old were you? I was, so I came to Connecticut in 17, 16. 15, wow. when I was really into it, 15 and 16 years old. Yeah, about 16, yeah. And then, and then I stopped around, six, you know, towards, going towards 17. They kept on, and that's when I got my first job. Um, well, not my first job, but my, to me, it was a real job. I worked for um, ILAF. I became an optician, not technician. Wow. Um, what, mu- what music did your dad play? What was his favorite, okay. an instrument or a singer? Or Guitar. What? He's a guitarist. Yeah. yeah. Peaches and Herb and all of them, they play yeah. together. And, uh, they do music. My father was a DJ also. Really? In New York. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't sing. That's, he can't not, dance, you know, I can't can, sing. It's all good. I grew up around a lot of musicians. Yeah. And a lot of music. And that was... Did you ever pick up an instrument? Yeah. Yeah, and what do you play? The drum mm-hmm. and the trumpet. I wasn't very good at the drum. I practiced, but the trumpet and the saxophone. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. That was my thing. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, okay, so this just went a whole different way. I had no idea what it was going to go to, but this whole music scene, and was there alcohol, drugs involved? Was it, yes. yeah? Oh, yes. Yeah? Um, seeing my father drink, my mother used to drink, but the one thing that I used to, which I learned when I was like five years old, is where I smoked my first joint. Yeah. At five. At five. He was my role model. Yeah. So back then, they had the marijuana in the uh, Christmas box, the car box. Mm-hmm. And, and they used to take it out, and I used to see him home. One day he wasn't home. I wanted to do what he did. And I rolled it up. It wasn't the best one. <laughs> Seeds falling out and everything. But mm-hmm. I lit it and I got hot. Did you? Know, you? I got in trouble too because I tried to hide it. And they didn't want me to do that. Yeah. You know, but today, like I know, I follow, I saw. Yeah. You know, 
Don't you look like you burn yourself. Yeah, I was pretty good at it. your skills. You got skills <laughs> at an early age. At an early oh age. My. Did you keep <laughs> smoking at that age? No, I didn't. I actually didn't. And um, I actually uh, would drink, mm-hmm. you know, go to school. I was picked on, um, bullied and stuff like that at a young age. And um, I would drink. I seen them drinking. So I would try to get a drink here and there every once in a while. Those are some of the memories, but not really clear. Yeah. But it was more towards um, the bullying. Something happened to me at a young age. Yeah. At that age, matter of fact. And so I didn't, I told them what happened, but nobody believed me. They just hush hush quiet. So I what? kept that internal. Do you know why you were bullied? Or I not that there has to be a reason, but. Whoa. Okay. Yellow banana. My hair did not um, stand up in an afro like everyone else's. And, um, so what's yellow banana? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, my skin color. Really? Yeah, like yellow too banana. Light, too light to fit in. Yeah, I never really fit it in anywhere because of different nationalities in me. Yeah, I was never black enough, never white enough, <laughs> never Spanish enough, never had enough Indian. I never had those. And I have all that mixture in me. And so I never really fit it in. And I mm. love school. Yeah. And I did. But I can remember. Those are some memories I can remember in the playground. You yellow banana. You oh, know. My hair's not. You don't have an afro. That's all. Wow. Well, that's happens yeah. today. So, like, even on the campus that I work on, we have, um, we have, cultural centers for black students and cultural centers for Latin students. And, you know, my students tell me I'm not, I'm not Hispanic enough to fit in there. They don't want me there. I'm not black enough to fit in there. They don't want me there. Yeah. Like we haven't learned a lot um, since you were bullied on the playground, sadly. Yeah. It, and it is a sad place. You know, today I look at, you know, I, I call myself, I say I'm a Christian. Mm-hmm. That's what I say. Mm-hmm. You know, well, what nationality are you, Christian? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and it doesn't matter. It's not about race. You know, mm-hmm. we all have the same blood. You know, same spirit. We have the spiritual being that's in us. And I believe we're supposed to motivate and help each other mm-hmm. and give to one another, and one another spiritually, mentally. Yeah. You know, and physically help people when they can't do something. And I really believe recovery teaches me how to become a man and do men things in here, in, mm-hmm. my, in between my ears. Mm-hmm. And so those are some of the things that I look back from my past experience and I use it to help me to reflect and help others today. Yeah. You know. I was in Colorado and heard from Don Coyas, who leads the Wellbriety Movement, which is, um, I'm going to use his phrase, mm-hmm. um, He refers to himself as an American Indian, Mm -hmm. Um, and he was telling me some of the cultural differences on whether you use indigenous or Native American or all of that. And so out of respect to him, I'm going to use what he uses, Mm -hmm. but he really sent a message of of us becoming the human race. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just think about like all the all the races that are mixed in you. You are a human, right? I am a human. Yes. Yeah. I really believe that. And it's funny when you used to see said American Indian. Mm-hmm. My grandma says, you're an original Native American Indian from the, the country. And I'm like, okay. You know? <laughs> so, and she, I remember, that's, that's when I was, I'm talking about this. I remember my grandma saying, you can't drink. I remember that. Right in Hackensack, New Jersey. Right. You can't drink. You're Indian. You don't know how to eat. It messes with you. Yeah. And I didn't listen. And you drank and it messed with you. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. Grandmas are pretty smart. Yes, they are. Yeah. <laughs> very smart. So was she an Indian? Was yes, she of yeah. that? To, yeah. What tribe? Um, Sioux. Sioux. Mm-hmm. Chak Sioux. There's some others. I don't remember them right offhand. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I've been recording stuff because she's 100 years old now. Wow. And still alive? Yes. I How take cool. care of her. Do you? Yeah. Here the, in Connecticut? Yes, sir. Uh, Oh. That's the gift of this, re- this recovery process. I'm so thankful to see Car and everything, all the pathways, because I'm in position. My grandmother finally said that. I couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. She just said it recently. Said what? 
I thank God for you being in position. You're my angel. Oh, there was a time sweet. when grandmother wouldn't give me the key to the house. Uh, <laughs> I understand. I understand. Yeah, but she gave it to me, and she's blind. Mm -hmm. She can't hardly hear it that much now. Mm -hmm. But I'm able to be there for her, for her finances, um, with the upbringing of the upkeeping of her home, mm -hmm. and to make sure her doctor's appointment things and needs are met. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was a point in time I really wouldn't have been able to do that. Oh, yeah. I would have ran. Yeah. I and I ran for years because of that. And you've been redeemed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Grateful and thankful. I just woke up this morning. I said, thank you. Mm -hmm. I do it every morning. Right. I was like, I'm not waking, I'm waking up with a hangover. I have the breath of life in my body, which I used to take for granted for so long. And I want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I want to live clean. You know, not just because I'm clean from drugs and alcohol, but I want a clean mindset, mm -hmm. a sober mind. Yeah. You know, you know, and um, I'm very grateful to not have the thought process and pattern that I had before to where it is now. It wants to evolve and grow. It's hungry. It wants to learn more and more. Mm -hmm. And that's a gift. It's priceless. No money can put it on it mm -hmm. because I'm hungry. You know, and I want to continue to stay in that process of um, um, positivity. You know, looking at, okay, what can I control? What can I do to change this, to better it, or if I'm not powerless? Mm -hmm. So what can I do? You know, acceptance. You know, and uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a grateful person. You I'm are. just grateful. I go, so I. I see you now as very humble, soft-spoken, kind, a man of service. And were you the same way when you were a kid? I mean, when you were like, I, you know, yeah. I, 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 because I, I think of the way you asked, you told somebody that you were bullied. Yeah. And they just wanted to keep it quiet. So you had some courage, too. You knew it wasn't right. And you asked for help, but you didn't really, you were just told to be quiet about it. So did you resolve it on your own, or did you internalize it, or have you thought about it? So when, I just want to, so when I was young, mm -hmm. I was inappropriately touched. Mm -hmm. It wasn't being bullied. Right. And it was by my brother, my oldest brother, mm -hmm. which I have forgiven. Yeah. And talked to, and wrote a letter and he cried about it mm -hmm. in later years. But I knew it wasn't right. Right. And I went to my father and, um, and they just was like, nah, that ain't mm -hmm. happening. No. And so I internalized, I got that hit for years. And so I really believed that my drinking started and my anger was building up inside of something that nobody would listen to. Mm -hmm. And also, was frowned upon in yeah. society. And so I'm like, that's not me. I didn't do that. That's not me. And I'm not going to tell anybody. Mm -hmm. But I'm sick as my darkest secrets. Yeah. yeah. And so the bullying, it, it really bothered me because I was free mm -hmm. as a young man. I was loved. Mm -hmm. And they wanted the best for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I... I was good with fantasizing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I was always playing, like I was in space, and all kind of space, like I said, 1999. Um, um, what was the other one? Um, Lost in Space. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Will Robinson. Yeah. I remember all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I just loved, I, I mean, I was free. We had fun at home. Me and my brothers played. Um, my brother Todd wasn't there, but it was also me and my brother Michael, and um, we did a, we we did a lot of playing, and you know, you know, we had fun together. You know, it wasn't like we were raised not to love one another, and mm -hmm. sometimes you should share your toys and things like that. You know, but it wasn't like in middle school that the bullying became more so, mm -hmm. and um. At that point, there was a turning point, but towards a negative. I got tired of being bullied. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a, this kid that was way bigger than me. And I kind of lifted him up, threw him against the locker. And then 
after school. Everybody, this is a fight after school. This is a fight after school. And I went out and I fought him, which my mother always told me, don't stand down. Mm -hmm. Stand up. Don't let them because they'll always bully you. And they're which bringing up other memories about my fighting. So I fought him and won. And everybody liked it. And I felt in. Mm -hmm. Here it is. I'm not looking that funny as the yellow banana and the hair and curly hair. You don't have an afro. And everybody's like, ooh. And I loved it. You like me. And so I didn't know I could fight. And I wound up fighting a lot. Mm -hmm. And nobody would mess with me. Now I got this reputation. Don't mess with him. He can fight. Mm -hmm. And that was the cool thing. So did, had you... <laughs> were you a natural fighter? Had you trained at all? Or did you know? I was, just... I was a natural fighter, and then my mom and them put me into martial arts. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. And so... I don't want them... <laughs> No. <laughs> no I, I didn't mean it like that. No, I'm not going to mess with you. No. I, well, maybe a little. <laughs> no, I, martial arts is to protect yourself. Oh, exactly. Yeah. It is exactly. not to... Right hurt anyone, yeah. it is for last resort, mm -hmm. you know, and I learned that. And so I never wanted to fight anybody really. Mm -hmm. But if you did, then I knew how to protect myself. Yeah. And again, society, the peers, they like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I had moved from Hackensack, I dropped out of high school, mm -hmm. and went to, um, well, I didn't. Well, I left um, Hackensack and went to uh, Patterson, New Jersey. Different, I won't say culture, but surroundings are totally different. Mm -hmm. You know, very hoodish. Yeah. Very. Uh, Hackensack was more relaxing. Mm -hmm. Well, hoodish. Um, that's the best way I can explain it. Mm -hmm. And my character changed. With the break dance on, now I became this real tough guy. And then fear because I said, oh, you live in Patterson. But when I go to the other the other um, towns, and um, I used to protect my brother. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted him to get an education. Um, I want, I did college prep for, uh, in high school for some time, and then I just lost interest. Yeah. When I say interest, like, I had gotten into drugs. Mm -hmm. Drugs. Um, I drank. And I smoked marijuana. And then from there, um, I was introduced to what they call base back yeah. then, but it's crack cocaine now. Yeah. And um, that was one of the worst things I was ever never done because it took control of my life. Mm -hmm. um, it made me feel good. It made me feel powerful. Um, and wanted in areas where people didn't want it. Yeah. What did you want? Did you have any aspirations or anything you wanted to be or do when you were a young man? What is it you hoped to? I know you said you wanted to be an astronaut when you were a kid, but when you're. I love space. Yeah, and when you started doing this, what would you. What did you want to do? Nothing. Yeah. Oh, I, I changed. I wanted to be a, a big time drug dealer. Did you? Yep. I wanted money. Did you succeed? Somewhat. <laughs> I believe did. it. I, I'll yeah. be honest. Yeah. I did. Uh -huh. I'm not proud of it. It's no, something I that I don't regret my past. I'll take a look at where I was because it mm -hmm. taught me to understand who I am today mm -hmm. and why other people think what they think. Um, but yeah. Um, I, and I, I like to pull back a little bit. My mother, when I was living with my mother, my mother always took me out to see the New York Mets, um, the Knicks, those front row seats and stuff like that. And um, today we know that costs a lot of money, but my family didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how, you know, today I thought back, how does he have this money? And so there were a lot of famous people that used to come to my house. Yeah? Yeah. Lawrence Taylor, mm -hmm. Michael Richardson. Okay, now I see what yeah. road you're going down. <laughs> okay. Yeah? Yep. Yeah. And, um, I learned something, you know, and my mother used to, when I used to take the marijuana out of her drawer to go get high with, she said, you don't know what you're doing. So that was her little side hustle to put food on the table, to, you know, to, for the rent and stuff. 
So as I was growing up, going to school, I'm still seeing and learning this, how to be a dealer, mm-hmm. you know, how to maneuver, um, how to like cars. Because mm-hmm. we just used to drive into school in a, in a Jaguar, two different colors, blue and black. And they weren't hers. It was Michael Richardson's. Mm. So I had to, I grew up in fantasy land. Yeah. I have the cars, I can have the money. Um, my family's going to leave me all this money because of who the dancing, you know, from the musicians and all that. And that's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Now, that's not always good luck to you. Is you your know? mom still alive? My mother died in 1996 wow. from this disease. Mm. She had scoliosis and she bled to death out of mouth. I was the one that got her to the hospital. I um. How old, when and when were you born? What year? 1968. 68. Yeah. 68. 96. Three years younger. Uh huh. So yeah, and you look a lot younger. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> Huh? He looks a lot younger than me. He's three years younger than me. And yeah, he looks way younger than you. Mm-hmm. Way younger than me. Never mind. Don't, don't, go, don't play with us as far as that goes. <laughs> so, 96. Wow, dude. What's so about that? It was one of, the, one of the excuses I used to use. Yeah. Um, My mother was my best friend. Uh-huh. She loved me. She wanted me to do the best I could. My mother also did use mm-hmm. um, crack cocaine on days back then. Abuse with my mother. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't want to, and that's a whole other story. Um, trying to bring her home. Mm-hmm. Um, but I went to prison in 1989. I didn't come home to the um, 1994 August. So I came home. Um, that's the first thing. No, so you went to prison in 1989. 1989. 89 to 94, you were in prison. Yeah. Okay. And so I always thought my mother would be here. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember my mom calling me at mm-hmm. the main prison here in Connecticut, and my mother said, uh, you're going to be coming institutionalized. And I was like, I can't think about not being here. These are my friends. These are my people that are here. Yeah. And I basically cut the outside world out. And I lived to survive in there because you could die. Mm-hmm. And um, it was really rough at the time I was in there. People were dying and all kinds of things. And um, how, did, how did you survive? Okay. I became what you call um, a gang member. Mm-hmm. And, um, were you the leader? Yeah, I was one of them. Well, I can see that yeah. in you. Yeah. I did that for years. Mm-hmm. Um, it was supposed to be something that started out just to help the inmates out mm-hmm. because we couldn't get certain supplies from the uh, correctional officers. It was a lot of craziness, a lot of um, stuff that would you think that everything is being done right in there, not. Uh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so there was a lot of racism in there, um, on all kinds of races. Everybody mm-hmm. just didn't like each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a way of life in there for me to feel secure, yeah, to have my needs met, and um, so that I could go home. And you kind of knew the rules too, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I or made the well, rules. you learned the rules. <laughs> One of the rules was stay clean, mm-hmm. and I didn't know. And I remember when I was in there, they tied my cell door. This was at the county jail, and threw a whole bucket of water on me. And I wanted to get to them. I couldn't because they tied the door and everybody had like they were sleeping. The guard came in and took me out of there and brought me to another part of the jail. And they said, young brother, you got a problem with anybody? I'm like, no. He says, do you take showers? I said, yeah. I said, oh, well, my feet stink sometimes. He said, he said, don't take it. This was just, there was just them let, their way of letting you know to take a shower to make sure your feet clean. Don't take it personal. Mm-hmm. Just take it as one. They don't. They not mad. They just want you to do that. So that was my first lesson in there. <laughs> so I made sure I stayed clean because <laughs> I still had to go up the way. <laughs> I didn't want any problems because it was worse up there. Yep. But um. You so you have stinky feet, huh? No, no, not now. <laughs> what? We get clean. You smell I, great. <laughs> I, you remember how? Well, no, no. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> 
But my um, when I came home, I thought my mom would always be there. Yeah. yeah. She died a year and two months later. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, that right there was I blame God. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget that. I went in there, and uh, I was like, "Why did she take her?" You know, my son was still in the belly of my uh, fiance at the time. Mm-hmm. Stomach, and I told my mom why she. Well, my grandmother said she couldn't hear it. She couldn't hear me. She was on a respirator, and I said she can't hear me. I was talking, and the tear went down her eye. Yeah. And I said, "Mom, I'm gonna mm-hmm. take care of my son. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna make sure that this woman don't worry about it." But as an an addict. It was so much pain, and my structure and recovery wasn't good. I went short, and I went that high, and then I cleaned back up, and I told a lie. I ain't telling my that high, so I'm sticking to my secrets, and um, I stayed clean for a few months more, and the um, the insurance money came in. I got out of the world. She left me some money, and I tried to do the next right thing. I tried to, I bought a new car. Um, I bought some furniture, bought some things for my fiance because she had, the baby wasn't born yet. But how are you trying to do right and buy a sports car and you're having a baby? Hmm. Where do you put the car seat? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I got upset, registered the car, and I went and got high. And I connected, and I always look at opportunity can sometimes be very bad for you. And this opportunity was bad for me, but to me it was good. And I took the money I had and used and flipped it and was down with a set of people and made a lot of money, got a lot of cars, um, and I seen a lot of craziness that I should not have been a part of. That was a very sketchy story, but we have to read between the lines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've so you so just so I make sure I heard you right. You saw an opportunity. You flipped your money, and then you ended up with a lot of cars. You did. You bought a lot of cars. So through drugs, I bought cars. Yeah. Um, everybody knows um, with drugs and alcohol and sex, money and all yeah. the world. So it was a lot of women, a lot of cars. I had a baby coming, and. It got me a lot of recognition as this big time guy, money yeah. man. Yeah. And I ran with that power mm-hmm. already being a gang member. Where were you? In Bridgeport, Connecticut. Yeah, hey, you were in Bridgeport. Yeah. Wow. All right. And that. Where did that lead you? <laughs> back to prison. <laughs> Simply put, right? Yep, back to prison. Um, it, it let me dig deeper down at this. It just took me way down. And I lost all that money. Mm-hmm. I lost all the cars. And um, I remember before my mother died, her saying that she put me out the house. And she said, I can't do this anymore. Crying like a baby, literally. <laughs> I was laying on the floor of the door. And I said, Mom, let me in. I'm your son. And she said to me, I have a husband to take care of and your sister. Mm-hmm. I couldn't understand that then. And I was angry and I left out of there getting high. She, but before I left, she said, all you do is come here to eat, sleep, rest, and take a shower. Mm-hmm. And you're off and running. And so that was my pattern for some time. Mm-hmm. You know, it was my pattern for some time. Um, I went back to prison for a slew of new charges. Um, house was raided looking for me, um, high bonds. Um, I went back to prison, and I stayed there until uh, 2005. Came home, got another year, and that was the last time. I said, I can't do this no more. All right. 2007, I came home. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to go back. And I renounced everything. I was like, I, I want it better for my life. I was exposed to NA in there and AA, and I would go to the meetings in there. Um, I went to pro drug programs in there, um, facilitate to become a mentor there. Um, but I seem to always go back out. 
Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand why. And um, when I came home, I worked for a cable company. And I stopped smoking cigarettes for like four years at that time. And I went and got hot because I was stressed out. Mm -hmm. Working so much, constantly. And then also not living in an, um, a healthy environment, I said, mentally. Mm -hmm. So I relapsed. And then I got myself clean again. And I stayed clean for about four years. And let's see. Did you run into CCAR or anything in That's before all that? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I was clean, clean for about four years. But when I came... I was in N.A., Mike Askew. Yeah? Yeah. I was the literature chair. And he had literature. And he was talking about, I asked him what the place was. And he was like, this is C-Car. Uh -huh. And I'm like, what's that? And he explained, let me explain this to you. And so he's telling me about it. Uh -huh. He said, you should come down. Mm -hmm. And I was going to my meetings, but I would come over there to see what it was about. And um, I really, really, really appreciate the doors being open when they were because they helped me to really feel more comfortable about myself and sharing where I was at with a group of people, you know, and nobody was judging me, mm -hmm. you know, and I would go through my ups and downs. And, and there's one particular instance I remember going in the office and Mike, I felt short and I was crying. And he said, well, go out there and tell them. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, I just, he says, they understand, go let them know you're back, you hear you know? Mm -hmm. And I did, you know, and um, that helped me to open up more. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm grateful to how CCAR showed me that it's okay to talk about where you're at, mm -hmm. and that there's a safe place to do that. Mm -hmm. But also, like when Art used to come and sit down and do the trainings and stuff, we all formed a bond together. Yeah, mm -hmm. and. It became the motivator. Mm -hmm. So what was looking, what was glamorous in the street and start start to lose its shine. Mm -hmm. We would go down to see car and sit together. I had someone to go to when I had a lot of time on my hand looking for a job or something. I could go and sit down, and there was unity there, you know. And that was the gift, one of the gifts. And to this day, we all talk, you know. We remember the old crew of people that were down there. And they're my old memories of things. I remember um, doing a Christmas tree there at the old other sea car. And as I was putting the star up top, an old memory came. I'm sorry. It's good. I'm sorry. I had to get off the ladder and go outside. I didn't want nobody to see me crying. Mm -hmm. And it was me putting popcorn, a needle through the popcorn, mm -hmm. around the tree. One of the memories that I love mm -hmm. with my mother and my father. And uh, I had told my... That's like I told Liz. And um, they were like, that's great, you know. That's a good thing, you know. And I was like, where did this memory come from? I don't remember this. And through addiction and drinking, it suppressed. It just, all things that were good that happened with my mother. And um, I was really grateful to remember that because I couldn't remember really at that time a good memory. Mm -hmm. I kept focusing on her death her dying and the man gone. And so that was it was wonderful for me. And I just we, remember that. I think that's old school because we used to make popcorn <laughs> strings too. My mom and dad, just a big bag of popcorn, you know, eat a few and string a few. Yes. And, and make those strings. Every year we made them because they didn't really last too long. No, they didn't. No. But that was something to do with my grandmother, yeah. my moms, and my dad. When we did do it, my my grandmother, who's still alive, 
always put has these ornaments and stuff to put on the tree and would get us gifts and my grandmother was like the backbone of the family mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she always was trying to instill and get a better education and i didn't understand that too much though yeah i do now yeah education is key information is key mm -hmm. it all depends on what source of information that i'm connecting to i'm plugging into so you this last time recovery stuck with you yes it did and i know you to be uh, i would say like a sponge you know you're like you you'll take anything and learn and ask questions you're very inquisitive so what have you learned since you know what have you learned since you've been on this recovery journey um i've learned to allow people to be who they are mm -hmm. everybody has a belief system and so who am I to try to change your belief system? I can only change mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Recovery starts with me first. Mm -hmm. And so when I stay focused on me and learn to love me and accept me, I learn to accept you mm -hmm. and love you unconditional, no matter what you're saying or where you're at. You know, um, belief systems are key. And they also come from past experiences, which I learned about myself. So I can't change you mm -hmm. if that's your belief system, what your experience was. Only the information and your application will do that. Mm -hmm. And recovery has taught me, CCAR has taught me, to stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. Allow people to be where, where they are. Mm -hmm. How can I help you with your recovery? With being non-judgmental with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, are, where would you like to go? And... um. This journey has given me freedom beyond my wildest dream. Mm. I never knew that I could wake up and not have the urge to use or drink. I never knew I could wake up and not have harmful thoughts towards someone. I never knew that I could forgive even if you blast me mm -hmm. and just hope the best for you and turn away and walk away. I was always a person, I have to check you. Mm -hmm. I got to say this, Are you, oh, who's looking, who's watching? I can't let nobody think that, oh, you got me. Today, if you want to say something to me, fine. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry you feel that way. Mm -hmm. It's up to me. Forgiveness is for me. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not for you. If I don't learn to forgive, if I hold a resentment, it becomes a mental blocker. It stops me from growing. Mm -hmm. And I want to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. I want to continue to learn. I want to continue to enjoy life. I want to continue to enjoy people. I want to continue to understand where they're at. You know, listening to learn, learn to listen, you know, active listening, something mm -hmm. like that, yeah. leg of stool, managing my stuff. All those things play a part in my life today. And I don't just have to sit there and read or, or it's, it's like me waking up and brushing my teeth and washing my face. Mm -hmm. It's the first thing I get up and do and pray. And wash your feet? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> so, so speaking of Oh My Lord, so you mentioned that um, with all the who are you that uh, you are a Christian. So yes, where sir. does that come into your journey? My spiritualness is my center. Um, without that, I will lose my soul. Did you have some thread of that all through your life? or? Yes. Actually, my mom used to take me to a Baptist church. And I used to, I could tell you funny stuff. <laughs> I used to get scared. Yeah. You know, I'm sitting in there, and they, yeah. they, the pastor played around, mm -hmm. and somebody told, hallelujah. <laughs> and, and I said, <laughs> you know, and as a young man, I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. You know, you just had to go to church. You need to be there on Sunday. Mm -hmm. You know, I was told that's it, you know. And I was told that about going to hell and all that, and I didn't want to go to church until, and I found out my spiritual journey is something I must find out, not the God of church where my mom and them were raised and where they went. I need to find out what was good for me. Mm -hmm. And I did that, you know, and I found out God was a loved and caring God, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and like anything, there are all consequences to what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but it doesn't mean he doesn't love me. And I didn't think I could be forgiven. 
I have to say that for a very long time mm -hmm. because of the lifestyle that I lived, the things I had did, the places I had been, the people I ran with, the things that they did. And um, I didn't think I ever could be forgiven until I seen people in prison who were praying and asking for forgiveness to change their life. And um, this recovery process has taught me that I was where I was in my mindset. I believed that that was the right thing at the time, but I found it was wrong. And as long as I asked for forgiveness, my life changed. Mm -hmm. I can be clean. And so that's how I look at in recovery. I'm going to make mistakes. I'll have a lapse in judgment. But the fact that I recognize it and I do something about it and don't hide it and let somebody know what my God is doing for me mm -hmm. so that someone else doesn't have to stay stuck in that mindset either. I'm doing my job. 